Hello and welcome to this module on hacking web servers. Let's see what we'll be covering in this video. We'll take a look at web server vulnerabilities and then we'll follow that up with what types of web servers are out there and how many of each. Then we'll look at the different web server attacks and follow that with the impact of web server attacks. And finally, we'll close off with countermeasures against hacking web servers. Let's look at some web server vulnerabilities. Default settings. Well, pretty much a lot of the hacking of web servers that happens out there is as a result of sysadmins leaving default settings as they are default usernames, default passwords, as well as default um, file allocations, file settings, file execution types, etc. etc. And this is actually a very low hanging fruit, a very easy way to hack a web server is by literally looking for default settings or trying default settings for, for certain web servers because sysadmins haven't changed them and you'll be surprised how many are out there. Same with default accounts, usernames and passwords. They're not only for web servers, but pretty much for a lot of internet facing devices. You must always change the default accounts because this is a very, very easy way to hack into or get access to um, devices or systems and I, we have covered this in previous modules as well. Misconfiguration is probably the, the biggest web server vulnerability and that's pretty much where a sysadmin hasn't configured the server or the application on the server, very important, properly. You could have the, the best server configuration out there but if the application running on top of that server has not been configured correctly you will get be able to get access to that server and we'll look at an example of that in the demo. Software vulnerabilities. There are thousands of software vulnerabilities and many are launched every day. So it is very important for, for sysadmins to patch their software often and reboot and maintain their servers because with new software vulnerabilities it is easier for tools like Metasploit or even crafted hand tools that um, individuals create out there to actually crack these software vulnerabilities and then gain access to web servers. Lack of security policy and procedures. This is pretty much a process issue and it talks to the default settings, the default accounts, the misconfiguration. If you have a really good security policy and a really good security procedure and you follow them, you should pretty much be as secure as possible as you could possibly be because security policy will talk about changing default settings, changing default accounts, how to configure servers properly, when to patch, how often to patch etc etc. Bad hygiene, backups etc. There have been a few cases recently um, where people have left full system backups including the databases on websites where people could literally just download it by going to a specific file path. So that just talks to bad hygiene. Once you've backed up the server, generally you shouldn't be keeping your backups on the same server, but a lot of people back up the server to the same file system and then copy that backup to somewhere else. If you leave that backup there and somebody gets it, well, guess what? They have all your data, all your system settings, etc., etc. And then finally, the rise of content management systems leads to a rich target environment. So what do I mean there? Well, if you look at at content management systems like WordPress, Joomla, Drupal. They are very, very popular and all over the internet. So I mean, at last count, I heard that WordPress is 23% of sites out there. So imagine if there's one WordPress vulnerability, guess what? You've got 23% of the internet to attack. So having a CMS, although it makes it very, very easy for you to manage the website as a novice end user, does create security risks and you must follow proper security policy and procedure to make sure that you are not a um, victim of, of a hacked web server down the line. So it's very important to keep up to date with the patches and the software updates that come out for these CMSs. Let's move on and look at the types of web servers that are out there. So there are three um, primary web server platforms out there. By far the biggest is Apache. Um, statistics differ from site to site, but 
the the one that I got this from says Apache is pretty much 65% of web servers on the internet and obviously Apache is open source and it runs on Linux as well as Windows but primarily on Linux and it has <clears throat> this far reach because of the the history of Apache being free and open source as well as the hosting of many 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 websites as well as all the popular content management systems like WordPress, Drupal and Joomla all run on Apache. Okay, the next one up is Microsoft's IIS. That's pretty much 20% of the market, more or less. And that's growing substantially with the Azure Cloud where you can now provision applications directly on Azure and all of Azure services generally run on IIS. That is followed by Nginx, which is uh, pretty much used by the very, very large websites. People like Facebook, Twitter, um, they all use Nginx because it has very good multi-threading capability and that's currently 12% of the market and then there's many 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 others but they only make up 3% of the market so from a penetration testing point of view you obviously want to concentrate on these two over here because that's literally 85% of the market so knowing Apache and IS backwards really really helps as your skill increases as a penetration tester. Let's go look at the different web server attack techniques. We've covered some of these techniques in other modules, but I mean the techniques can be used across the board. But these are the primary techniques to attack web servers with. First one is denial of service. There was an entire module on denial of service. And obviously denial of service is literally taking the web server offline using tools or bandwidth floods, etc, etc. Then there's <coughs> DNS or domain hijacking. This is more an attack on the actual web application, but it does affect the web server. And what we do there is <coughs> we set up a fake website that looks exactly like the current web server and then redirect DNS. So when people type in the domain, instead of going to the correct web server, they go to the fake web server and they get pretty much um, infected with malware or whatever it is that you want to do on that fake web server. The next one is brute force login and that's obviously for remote administration. So if you have SSH for, for, um, for Linux or RDP for Microsoft out on the internet and it's pretty much open to any IP to connect, well then you are vulnerable to a brute force login attack and we looked at that in the password module where we used um, Hydra to actually brute force an SSH login on a server. Then there's directory transversal. Directory transversal is pretty much where the web server has been misconfigured and you can, by altering the URL in your web browser, go to different paths or different paths on the file system instead of the actual web application. And that's pretty much a misconfiguration. And directory transversal could lead to a um, data exfiltration if you have backups, as I mentioned in the previous slide, lying on a file path that can be accessed via the web server's URL. Then we have buffer overflow, and this is pretty much talking to how web, web server vulnerabilities are created or found. And what a buffer overflow does is pretty much once you've overflowed the memory buffer of the web server, the web server acts in an unexpected way. And this unexpected way could be things like disclosure, it could be things like command execution, it could be a whole host of things. And that's why when you see all these uh, security vulnerability warnings that come out for Apache IS or any actual software out there, it's all because of how a buffer overflow has, has pretty much created this unexpected event and how you can use this unexpected event to compromise the system. And then finally, there's command execution, where you can literally, depending on the misconfiguration, you could upload a script to a website and execute a command from the website that actually attacks the web server operating system. And we're going to look at that in the demo later. Let's move on to the impact of web server compromises. So the impact of web server compromise, I mean, well, what, what are the, the, the pitfalls? Well, there are quite a few, and it is quite a serious thing that could happen to you. First one is reputational harm. If your website goes offline, or if it's defaced, or if um, user data or subscriber data is stolen, it, it, it's a very embarrassing affair. And it could also lead to lawsuits and a whole bunch of other 
really nasty thing. So it's better to just avoid it in total. Then there's the beachhead into the network. And this is actually from a penetration pointing test of view. The reason why web servers are so dangerous because if you are hosting your web server on the corporate network, even if it's in a DMZ or if it's behind three firewalls, once somebody has access to that web server, they have a beachhead or an entry into your network. And from there, they can pivot and go look and go find the Active Directory or LDAP or your databases, etc., etc. So best practice, in my opinion, and there's many people who differ, is to always have your website hosted totally separate to your corporate network because the website is pretty much allows anonymous access and your corporate network should only allow authenticated access. So picture it this way, having anonymous access on your website and having your website hosted at your corporate network, well, that's pretty much like having someone come right up to your door and knock um, on your front door at any point in time. Whereas if you were in a secure environment, you'd obviously want to authenticate that person before they even got to the door. So always try and keep your web server hosted separate from your corporate network. Then there's defacement, which we've talked about before, and this has pretty much been the modus operandi of a lot of uh, hacktivists out there, where they pretty much take over the web server and then change the actual landing page with some sort of political, religious, or just embarrassing message. Data theft, we've discussed where backups are left behind, but even if you compromise a web server, you can get to the data, your subscriber data, system data, whatever it is, you can exfiltrate it. And then finally, malware servicing. If we can compromise a web server <clears throat> and then put a malicious script there that downloads malware, Trojans, whatever the case may be, as we discussed in the, the previous modules of malware, well, then from there, you pr can pretty much start compromising a whole bunch of other, other victims. So think of the web server as a watering hole. People come to the actual web server to look at something, but in the background, they're being... Um, fed malware, which then compromises further systems on the internet. Let's go look at what countermeasures are in place. So let's get started with countermeasures. Great. First and foremost, and the most important software patches. Always patch your servers. Maintain your web server. Update the operating system. Update the application with whatever patches are released by the vendors because this protects you from vulnerabilities. There's no other way to protect you from a vulnerability, specifically zero-day vulnerabilities where there are no patches for them. That's why it's so important to patch your server regularly, often, and as soon as the patches are released, with testing, of course. Then server and network and server and software hardening. Basically, you know. It's, we've discussed hardening in previous modules and basically making sure that the software is only presenting the services it really has to and the server is only running the services it really has to to, create, to pretty much minimize the attack surface of what the penetration tester is able to actually see and do. Then vulnerability scanning. Um, the bad actors out there are scanning your website for vulnerabilities as it is. So it's always a good idea to get ahead of them and actually scan your website and look at what vulnerabilities are on your web server and pretty much try and fix them proactively before somebody else takes advantage of them and attacks them. And there's a lot of free tools as well as paid tools out there. Um, I think we looked at Nick2 in the previous modules and that's a very good basic web server um, vulnerability scanning tool. Firewalls, so this goes without saying, you should always have a firewall in front of your web server just to make sure that you pretty much protect the web server itself from any service or services that shouldn't be exposed to the internet. Restrict remote administration. So obviously, if you're, you want to administer your web server remotely via SSH or RDP, depending on what platform you're on, but you need to restrict the access to that, and you can do that with firewalls. So for example, you should only allow SSH or RDP from your corporate IP address, not from any IP address on the internet. And this pretty much restricts the brute force login um, attack that we discussed earlier, because if people can't get to the SSH or RDP login, then they can't brute force and try and get access to the remote administration of the web server. Change your default settings. Always, that is a, a given for any system or service, but you should always change any default settings that are set to something that 
is pretty much <coughs> aligned to your security policies and procedures. Penetration testing, that goes without saying, it's pretty much the same as vulnerability scanning, but in this case you get an expert to come actually look and think like attackers out there and try and find the vulnerabilities that the scanning um, wouldn't pick up in a normal um, scan of things. And this is especially important for custom developed websites. We've actually got a company or your, or your IT department, whoever it is, developing a, a specific web application for you using .NET or Java or whatever the case may be. Because if it isn't part of a larger group of um, of CMSs as an example, well then it's going to have its own set of vulnerabilities and you need a penetration tester to actually uncover the custom developed software vulnerability should they exist and then finally constant vigilance you should always have monitoring on your website you should always look for any file or system changes on your website or web server and you should always pretty much make sure that you look at the log files and try and restrict access as i said before a web server is your primary target it is where penetration testers generally start it's where bad actors generally start attacking because it allows anonymous access you pretty much have to open the web server and allow people to access the websites that are on that web server so just be sure to keep a very constant eye on that web server and that pretty much ends this uh, video on hacking web servers thank you for watching